Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ninth edition of the CTA annual conference. Thank you for joining this outstanding event. This year, we will focus on a very critical and very hot topic. But before starting, please let me just introduce CTA, the Commodity Trading Association. CTA has been created 10 years ago, in 2012. And today, it regroups more than 800 professionals graduated from the Commodity Trading Diploma and Master of the University of Geneva. In addition, CTA has also developed one of the largest international networks in the commodity trading, shipping, and financing industry worldwide. CTA has three main goals. Promote the Diploma and Master of the University of Geneva, support the alumni in their career development, and most importantly, to build bridges between the alumni, the market experts, and the commodity trading companies of the industry. To reach these goals, CTA deploys a wide range of activities in Switzerland and abroad. We organize outstanding conferences, webinars, and also we do sport events like golf, tennis, and so on, plus a lot of networking events. But beyond these activities, CTA has also another goal, to promote the sustainable development of our industry by triggering exchanges and by creating synergies and opportunities for the professionals. Decarbonization of the global economy is today certainly one of the main challenges, not of the century, not of the next decade, but is a current challenge. And all commodity training actors have a critical role to play, especially in the energy transition. Luckily, today we observe a big shift. Trading companies are moving fast. They are transforming their business models and they are committing to reduce their carbon footprint. However, to reach the targets currently discussed at the COP26, the industry is facing two main challenges. The first one is linked to technologies. The current solutions are not able to fulfill yet the global demand and the needs of the market. But this is not linked really to the technological issues, but it's mostly linked to the fact that we cannot scale up the offering in a way that will be profitable for the current actors. And this brings me to the second challenge, a huge constraint. The second challenge is linked to economics. Economics still play a big role in the game. Profitability criteria are essential in this business especially in trading. Transition has a cost. And these costs need to be supported by the actors and ultimately by the end users. In this context, regulators and financial institutions must have a bigger role to play in the game. Despite all the challenges, energy transition is also creating fantastic opportunities not only for trading companies, but it's creating opportunities for a wide range of activities. Sustainability is a booming sector, and this shift is creating new businesses, new professions, new career possibilities for the coming generations. In our opinion, the overall increase of competencies and innovation capabilities will be the driver of a real change. And we need to strongly support it. But today, we have the chance to have an outstanding panel with us. And we really look forward to discover how this challenge can be faced and how sustainability can create opportunities for all the actors. Thank you, Julien. So I will be brief. So dear participants, my turn now to, uh, to welcome you to this conference. 
On behalf of the CTA Association, we would like to warmly thank you for your presence tonight, and we hope you will enjoy this evening. We are very excited that you are all here tonight and to be able to get together again to speak about a hot topic, especially during this time of pandemic. As you have seen in your booklet, in the booklet you have received, tonight we have an amazing panel of experts. And I would like to express my deepest gratitude to all of them for accepting to be speakers and moderators at this conference. Given their role in their respective companies, we can only imagine how valuable their time is. So many thanks for sharing it with us tonight. It's an honor to have you here. And I also want to, 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 to mention the fact that we had Tagi, uh, the speaker from SOCAR, is also part of our committee uh, in the, of the association. So it's also uh, great, and we are very proud of having him with us. So I would like also to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, without whom this conference simply could not have taken place. So we have Swisscote Bank, we have also uh, SOCAR, we have uh, BRS Group, Trade Data Monitor, we have ECA and the University of Geneva. So many thanks to them uh, for making this conference possible. So our goal tonight is uh, that whatever your role is within your industry, is that you will come away with something. So a new idea, a fresh perspective, a new strategy that you will be able to apply in your business. So we hope that this conference will enable you to fulfill this goal. So the format of this conference uh, just to give you an idea of what you expect. So Olena, our talented moderator, will take a few moments to introduce each panelist. Then she will kick off the conversation. And then the second half of our time tonight, uh, we will open the floor, we will open up the floor for some questions. You will have the opportunity to ask questions to our experts. And finally, probably the moment you all expect, you will be able to enjoy a nice cocktail that will take place in the room just behind myself. So now I'll leave the floor to Olena, and we wish you a lovely evening. Thank you, Mikhail, for talented moderator. <laughs> I want to start with one number. Four trillion dollars. It's a combined GDP of Italy and France. And it's how much we have to invest every year in green energy project to reach net zero by 2050. It will be not enough, but it will give us 50% chance to keep global warming at 1.5 degrees. But what happened if we do nothing? Imagine one billion climate immigrants. They lost their homes and families. They're crossing the border, trying to find a place of safety. And you and your family can be at that place. It will be not a Hollywood movie. It will be your reality. What else can happen by 2050? Our economy will be doubled because we will have much higher standard of life in developing countries and plus two billion people on the planet. We have to provide additional access to electricity to 800 million people. At the same time, dropping energy consumption by 8%. It's entire Europe. But what happened if we do nothing? Imagine sea level is rising by one meter. And we have 40% of global population who lives close to the sea coast. Amsterdam, gone. Hamburg, gone. London, gone. 
Venus, already gone. And I can continue this list. Our energy system is based on 80% on hydrocarbons, and we need to drop it to 20. We built the entire system during the whole century and need to transform it within only one generation. Pipelines, refineries, ships, petrol stations, everything should be changed. And we need to build new and even larger infrastructure. It's a tremendous effort. But what happens if we do nothing? Right now, we're facing a huge reality check at COP26 in Glasgow. Alok Sharma, COP president, called it our last best hope to keep 1.5 in reach. Global leaders, they're reviewing their pledges because we know we are 30% short in emission reduction than needed. It's a call for urgent action with a promising statement that COP must deliver. Hot topics are how to phase out of coal, how to mobilize trillion, trillion of investment, and how to find this effective carbon trading scheme. And today, we will echo some of those topics during our conference, including delay. And I would like to open this conference with a small introduction. We will have two topics. The first one, it's decarbonization of oil and gas supply chain. We start from extractive industry, move to refineries, and end up with trading view. And the second big block would be about, will be about carbon trading. We will have two Q&A sessions, one in the middle and second one at the end. And probably the most important part of our conference is to have a glass of wine, or maybe two at the end. And I would like to ask our speakers to introduce themselves. Solomon, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Zomo Fischer. I'm the Vice President Sustainability at Lundin Energy. I've been here for two years in Geneva. I arrived just before the lockdown started, so it wasn't the best introduction to the country. But I was much happier to be here than back in London, that's for sure. Um, before, at Lundin Energy, I was responsible for the sustainability and climate change practice at Accenture in the UK, where I focused mostly on oil and gas. And in fact, I've been in oil and gas most of my life, including as a child. Um, I grew up in Africa and in the Middle East. Both my parents were biologists working on environmental impact assessments for big oil companies. So a lot of my childhood memories were following them around, doing impact assessments in the middle of nowhere, and getting to hold the tape measure and uh, counting plants and animals on the ground. But uh, definitely a really nice experience, and I'm still here in the industry, so clearly it made an impression. Thank you, Zomo. Hello, everyone. I'm Elsa Pernot. I am the group head of HSEC, which is basically sustainability for um, Gunvo. I arrived in Geneva at the same time as Zomo, actually, uh, from London as well. Um, I was previously working uh, for a company uh, called Petrofac on a division working on the whole upstream supply chain and I was um, head of sustainability for that division. Um, working obviously on sustainability issues on changes of culture, safety culture, environmental culture in a company, um, which is uh, very similar to a change of culture when you talk about sustainability and how people behave. So it's very useful uh, today as well. I was born uh, in Africa, in Madagascar. So I'm uh, very happy to be um, 
a token of diversity here, even if I don't look like it. I was born in, in Africa, but I'm also happy to be with Olena, a, some woman on stage. Um, I am uh, very honored to be here today. I think um, it's a great opportunity to discuss those uh, issues, and I look forward to your questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Tagi Tagezada. I'm from Sokar Trading. Um, I'm in Geneva already over six years, and before that, I worked with Sokar in Baku. So I'm, uh, I'm proud to say that I'm a product of Sokar system. I entered the oil um, industry with a Sokar Total scholarship and picked up some French culture and language on the way. And now I'm enjoying the Switzerland uh, as a, a person who is. Uh, trying to get more and more introduced into European and Swiss realities along with such a hard topic as sustainability is. Um, I come from a country that uh, is responsible for a lot of firsts in the oil industry and uh, this is something also that played a big role in the past. Uh, first commercial wells, first pipelines, first tankers. Uh, we were producing over 50% of the world's supply around a century ago in the beginning of the last century. Pardon, and, uh, so, as we say in Azerbaijan, every person uh, has a little bit of oil running in their blood for such a small country having uh, such a big footprint in oil industry. So this is uh, also a subject that is very dear to me uh, because we all want, and um, I can speak for myself, but also for Sokar and my colleagues, and uh, that today everyone wants our job to be a bit greener tomorrow than it is today. And that's what we work on, that's what we strive for, and uh, that's what we hope to action. Um, I want to thank the organizers and uh, the delegates and the speakers. And I want to ask you for one little exercise. If you don't mind to give a very strong, big round of applause, I will explain to you why is it important. If you don't mind, please. This, this applause were for you, for the audience, because you are here today because you care about it, you care about the subject. And I think that is very important, and we'll get to that, uh, I think, towards the end, that I think in the end it all goes to our personal responsibility, how we change things. Thank you. Thank you, Tagi. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. It's great to see uh, uh, this room uh, full of people. We, we are not used to that anymore. So my name is Alexis Cazin. Um, I am uh, with Cargill since 2014. I am in Geneva since 2000. I started my career in Paris and then in uh, Moscow, where I spent four years with uh, Total. I continued with Total in Geneva, and then I moved to Cargill in 2014. My career is, has been mostly over the last 13, 14 years in biofuels. I started at Total, moved to, to Cargill with that, um, slowly decarbonizing my own career. Um, and um, yes, uh, I started the carbon markets uh, for Cargill 18 months ago, so I cannot say I'm a veteran of this market. Uh, still consider myself as a beginner, but I think more or less everybody is a beginner here in this field. So I will try to explain you that. Good evening. I'm Mattia Ferracchiato from BRS Brokers. I'm head of carbon. Apparently, I'm the outsider here because I moved from Madrid uh, uh, seven months ago. I was lucky because it was kind of right after COVID and I was able to enjoy the summer here, the lake. Um, I've been trading and uh, providing services to more than 200 companies, uh, trading uh, carbon credits, of course, both ETS credits and voluntary carbon credits. I kind of have a hybrid uh, background because I'm, I, was st I started as a geologist or focused mainly on oil then I switched to energy engineering, and, and it's when I get closer to carbon because I was studying carbon capture and storage. At that time, it was really funny because I had to find the price of CO2 online, and I wasn't able to find it. And I was like, and I was like how come CO2 was a price? And I remember I had to call a program, Horizon 2020, Horizon 2020 in Brussels to find out the price of CO2. And now it's basically everywhere and we are full aware of the CO2 price, and, uh, and it's gonna be the main tool to, to fight climate change. Thank you. Thank you. I like the idea of slowly decarbonizing career. 
Alexis, I think that many recruiters will use it. <laughs> Good one. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce our first speaker, Zoma Fisher. And Zoma will talk about the uh, decarbonization of uh, extractive industry and uh, certification of cargoes. Zoma, floor Thank is yours. you very much. So I think probably uh, many of you are familiar with Lundin Energy, I guess, but for those who are maybe a little bit less familiar, we are an independent exploration and production company based solely offshore in Norway. Um, we are targeting around 200,000 barrels of oil per day of production, and we have 1.2 billion barrels in reserves and resources. So one of the, we're one of the larger players in the Norwegian continental shelf. Um, we also have some renewables assets. We have a hydropower project in Norway, and we have two wind farms that are under construction in Finland and in Sweden. Um, I think I'm going to go first today because I cover the upstream space, obviously. So what I'd like to share with you is Lundin Energy's view and, and my view on how the oil and gas sector is responding to the challenge of the energy transition and the role of upstream companies in playing with that, with that, whole, that whole story. And of course, we are right now at a very critical point, as Olena said, with COP26 in Glasgow, where um, we're seeing a lot of positive signals, I think. Um, we're seeing new commitments being put forward around methane pledges to reduce methane, around deforestation. Uh, we've seen net zero targets come to, to fruit from uh, huge economies like India. And um, there's a lot more work to be done, for sure. But I think what we are seeing is generally more nations are putting forward their carbon reduction targets. And the challenge is really how, how do those get implemented? Um, as was mentioned before, the challenge for us is to maintain a pathway of no more than 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, which is considered to be a, a safe zone for, for humanity in the future. But it is a, a huge, huge challenge. We cannot underestimate that, that challenge. Um, it's challenging because innovation, as was mentioned before, is nowhere near where it needs to be. And a lot of the technologies that will help us decarbonize in the future are today just in the R&D phase, or they are still to be, to be scaled up. And investment is, again, nowhere near where it needs to be. Um, and what's more, over the next 20 years, if we're to follow this pathway of decarbonization and, uh, and be in line with the Paris commitments, we have to cut emissions by well over 50% from today's levels. And at the same time, in 20 years, we will have population growing by 20%, and the middle class rising. We'll have 80% of middle class people in Africa and in, uh, outs outside the, the US and uh, North America and the EU. So they have expectations as well, and we have to be inclusive. We have to make sure that no one is left behind in this energy transition, that energy is still affordable, and we still keep the lights on for these billions of people. In any scenario that we look at, oil and gas will need to be a critical component of the energy mix in the future. Today, it's around 50% of the energy that we use that comes from oil and gas. And it'll, it'll be lower in the future. It needs to be lower, but it'll be there. Um, some sectors are just really difficult to decarbonize. Uh, Long-haul uh, aviation, uh, aviation, trucking, the, the shipping sector, and some industries as well are very difficult to electrify. So we will need to have affordable... Uh, oil and gas in the mix, hopefully with carbon capture and storage so that we can live in a society that is fully decarbonized while still providing energy that is affordable for everybody. And I think we'll continue to use oil and gas as well as a critical feedstock for everyday products. And in fact, the IEA predict that over 75% of the growth in oil in particular over the next two decades is going to come from the petrochemical sector. And that's quite interesting because those products are usually fixed, the carbon is not emitted, and that's where I think the industry needs to shift. Um, but having said that, it is important to note that the production of oil and gas today is incredibly carbon intensive. If you look at the total global emissions from just the production of oil and gas, it's about 5% of global emissions. That's equivalent to approximately the aviation and the shipping sector combined. So it's a significant chunk of, of the world's problem. And it's, it's too high, and it has to be tackled. If you were to reduce that, even by 80% or by 70% in line with a net zero future, that's equivalent to removing one billion cars from the road and uh, saving those emissions. And the, uh, the oil and gas companies, in particular the majors and the integrateds, have really woken up to this challenge, I think, especially over the last 24 months. 
uh, we have seen in the majors the number of net zero targets triple in this year alone compared to the year before. And it's almost like the people who don't have a target are the ones who are left out now, it seems. Um, we've seen the spend in M&A from the majors on uh, clean energy grow at 50% per year in an annual growth rate. And the capex on renewables has doubled from 2019 to 2020, but it's still quite small, actually, in relative terms if you compare to capex on fossil fuel development. Um, and the diversification story for these larger companies, the integrated companies, is, is really quite different. If you look at Equinor, for example, one of our peers in Norway, in 2030, they estimate that approximately 5 to 8% of the energy they put onto the market will be from renewables. And Total Energies, as an alternative, you see what they're doing, they estimate that about 20% of the energy that they sell will be from renewables in 10 years' time. So there's a real difference in the level of ambition that we see. Uh, you also see oil and gas companies transitioning and leaving the fossil fuel sector altogether, like Ørsted Energy, and saying au revoir to fossil fuels. But that leaves the upstream space, the independence, which is where Lundin Energy sit. So we believe that the winners in this energy transition will be those that can still produce the oil and gas that the world will still need in the future, but safely at low cost, so to be very resilient, um, as we have seen through COVID, you know, very low oil prices, and also at low emissions. And that is really Lundin Energy's vision. In terms of cost, our OPEX per barrel, our production costs, are about $3. So we're very resilient and insulated against future price shocks and risks um, no matter what scenario that you look at. And that's important, I think, if oil and gas companies want to survive in the energy transition. Similarly, our carbon intensity of the production, so our operational carbon intensity, is about three kilograms of CO2 per barrel, which is about five times lower than the industry average. And I will say we are lucky to be in Norway, where there's a very high carbon tax, one of the highest in the world, and that's helped us to be in this position. We welcome that policy and that regulation. Um, earlier this year, we set out a target to become net zero across our full operations, including our own supply chain, by 2023. So very, very soon. And that's my main job at the company is to deliver this, to deliver this goal. And what, we're gonna, what that means, that net zero, what that means is every barrel that we produce from 2023 onwards will have had no net emissions released to the atmosphere from its production through electrification, through renewable energy, through uh, installing battery hybridization on our supply vessels uh, using biogas, we are able to cut the absolute emissions of the production by about 50%. And the remainder is what we have to deal with, which is very difficult to, to, to reduce. And for that portion, we are investing in our own natural carbon capture projects around the world. Uh, we're investing about $50 million there, and that will deliver us a stream of carbon credits from natural carbon capture that will help us to neutralize those residual emissions that we have, which are very difficult to abate. And combined with that $50 million and the rest of our investment in decarbonization, it's almost a, it's almost a billion dollars that we're spending over the next five years to do this. That delivers a huge amount of, of saving for us. It's a saving in carbon tax in Norway of $2 billion over the next decade. It's an additional revenue stream of $600 million from gas that we can now sell because we don't have to use it to power the platforms. We'll be, we'll be electrified using power cables to shore, which means that that gas can now be sold in the market rather than used as, as a fuel source to run the extraction. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it's, for us, it's a real value driver. This is about delivering shareholder returns, not just about being a responsible and a low carbon operator. But the story doesn't really end here. Now we want to turn this into value for our customers. So we became one of the first companies last year to certify our barrels as carbon neutral or as, as, as net zero, if you like. So that means that every barrel that is certified has had its emissions reduced, and the ones that cannot be reduced from, this, from the production are being neutralized through, uh, uh, through third-party programs. And it has been very challenging to get that in place because the carbon offset market, as we will learn about uh, later on, is, is a growing market. Prices are increasing. But thankfully, because our emissions are so low in Norway, the cost for us to, to neutralize a barrel of oil by using carbon capture credits from the market of our own projects is about one cent per barrel. So it's not very much. 
Um, today, in fact, 60% of our production is now certified as carbon neutral. And all of our cargoes from our large asset, uh, our, net our net production in, in Norway called Johan Sverdrup, they are entirely carbon neutral at the point of sale. And it's been a huge uh, interest in the market that we have seen. We have sold so far three cargoes carbon neutrally produced and to all customers that we never sold to before. So it's helping us diversify the, 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 um, uh, the customer base. And I think as with other commodities, such as aluminium and LNG, where we have seen market uh, demand for low carbon or net zero uh, versions of those commodities, I think the world is definitely moving in, into that direction, and we'll see where it goes. I'm not going to say anything more about that, because I think Taki's going to talk more about uh, the carbon neutral crude market. Um, but I look forward to your questions and hopefully have a debate with you as we move forward. Yes, thank you, Zomo. I think that I have uh, one takeaway, that uh, regulations in Norway, they actually accelerated decarbonization of uh, production. Yeah. And um, good luck with your challenges to achieve net zero in two years. Yeah. And the next one uh, is Elsa Perno, who is a global head of HSEC in Gunvar Group, and Elsa will talk about uh, options for refinery transformations and quantification of emissions. Elsa, floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction on um, the first stage of the value chain in the oil and gas. Um, I just want to take a little bit of time. I don't know how familiar you are with all the jargon about what is scope one, scope two, scope three, what is greenhouse gases, what is CO2 equivalent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm sure you're all very proficient on these topics, but still, I mean, we have CO2, we talk about CO2 all the time. And by the way, sustainability is not only energy transition, right? Sustainability is a lot wider than energy transition. We're talking about social areas as well, right? We have to keep that in mind. Nevertheless, we only have a couple of hours today, so we're going to focus on energy transition. Um, energy transition, CO2 emissions. We talk about CO2 emissions because CO2 is the gas that is um, everywhere, that, that is very delocalized, that is emitted from a lot of different sources. Nevertheless, it's not the only greenhouse gas, right? We have a lot of other ones. We have methane, the famous methane that a lot of uh, people are talking about today, uh, including in Glasgow, which is very good news, which is a more potent gas than CO2. So methane in the atmosphere warms the atmosphere faster than CO2, but it has a shorter uh, life in the atmosphere. You also have N2O, you have HFCs, PFCs, SF6, those are um, greenhouse gases as well. The good news is that the emissions are more uh, centralized, so, and we have been able to tackle the emissions of those gases as well. But they're there. So when we talk about CO2 equivalent, we take into account all those, all, all those gases as well. So there's a real difference between CO2 emissions and CO2 equivalent emissions. Then we have the different scopes. I'm sure you have heard of scope one, scope two, scope three, what the hell are those scopes? Basically, you have scope one. When people talk about their emission, they're talking about the direct emissions from the assets, from the equipment they own, they control, uh, financially, operationally. Um, so when Zumo was talking about the emissions from the platforms, it's the emission scope one that is coming from the extraction and production of oil on the platform. Then you have scope two emissions that is related to the utilities you use in your activities, right? So electricity, but also heat. Obviously, when you use electricity that comes from renewable energies, your scope two emissions are zero. If you use electricity that is produced from a coal fire power plant, then that's another story, right? So scope two emissions exist, and they, we can reduce the emissions, but they are related to utilities. And then you have scope three emissions, and scope three emissions is all the rest. So you have the suppliers, and then you have what's happening downstream your activities. 
And this is where difficult things happen. Basically, as a trader, we all scope three. So here you go, what can you change? How can you make a difference, etc. We need to work on those scope three missions. That was a little uh, refresher. What does the split of emissions look like in the oil and gas, right? So when you look at oil, basically what you have upstream, production extraction, is 25%, 24, 25% of your emissions, right? Then you have everything related to shipping, transportation. This is 1%. And then you have downstream, when we use those products, right? Everywhere, people's behavior, how they use their cars, how we fly, how we do all those things individually. And this is a very, very big chunk. And this is very difficult because it's all over the place. When you look at LNG, it's very similar, slightly different in terms of uh, absolute emissions. But in terms of proportions, it's the same. The extraction, the production is 25-ish percent. 3% on shipping, and then it's how we use those. So this is really the challenge we have, right? We have companies that are able to control their scope one emissions, the way London is doing it, the way we're working on refineries. But then there's the usage of all those fossil fuel-based products. And this is where we're facing a huge challenge. Coming to my subject now, uh, basically, what is the role of refineries in the future energy landscape? So basically, if you take this map that, is, that has been defined by the International Energy Agency, this is the, the picture today. So basically, you have this big arrow coming down, coal, natural gas, oil. As a refinery, we sit there, we sit at the bottom of that arrow, we have a lot of work to do on producing those products that are going to be used all over the chain. It's a very um, central role. Going, uh, sending products to industries for transport, buildings and others, right? This is changing. Obviously, when you look at, again, the net zero scenarios from the International Energy Agency, we can disagree on that scenario. It's one scenario, it's one picture. Let's use that as a base, you know, so that we can actually have an idea of what it's going to look like in 2050. You see those arrows, right? They are getting smaller, a lot smaller. So for refineries, how do you stay relevant in this market? How do you stay relevant in the in energy industry? How do you still exist? You have heavy assets. You have a lot of um, workers, blue collars. You have a lot of know-how, but then your products are the ones that are emitting a lot of CO2 emissions when they are used by individuals, by companies. What do you do? Obviously, refineries are going to stay there, and they're going to stay there for activities that cannot be electrified. So basically, when we talk about um, decarbonization, the big thing we're talking about, the, the easy bit, is electrification, right? We electrify while we can electrify, and we produce that electricity with uh, renewable energy, carbon neutral energy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then there's everything that cannot be electrified that easily, right? As a refinery, obviously, you work on your scope one emissions. You work on your scope one emissions. What are the emissions from your operations? What are you emitting when you use your FCC? What you, are you emitting when you use your reformer? This, you can actually optimize your processes. You can optimize your energy use. You can do a lot of things. But this is tweaking, really. You're not going to get to zero that way. What you can do is also capture the carbon that you emit because some of the processes in the refinery intrinsically is going to emit CO2 because what it does really is cutting carbon chains to create other carbon chains. And some of the carbons are just aligned with oxygen that is in the air and it creates CO2. So what you do, you capture this. 
What you do with the CO2 afterwards is another matter, but still, you can capture it and you can store it. What you're going to do as well as a refiner, you're going to try and help industries, like petrochemical industries, reduce their CO2 footprint. So you're going to crack NAFTA from recycled plastic, for example. You're going to help them reduce their CO2 emissions. For refineries, it is also crucial to get into bioenergy. So the processes that are existing in refineries can be transformed, can be leveraged to actually produce, produce a bio, bioenergy, biofuels, biodiesels. You have a feedstock issue when you talk about biofuels, right? But more and more, we're talking about waste, we're talking about reusing things that would not actually um, take from other industries. And it's working better and better. And so modern bioenergy is definitely something that refineries are, work, are, are looking into. Um, and then there is the famous hydrogen, right? Hydrogen, everybody's talking about hydrogen. Um, it is going to be carrying renewable electricity everywhere, basically. Um, and hydrogen is in all future scenarios, right? We use hydrogen everywhere when we look at scenarios by 2050. Refineries have been producing and using hydrogen for a very, very long time. The problem is that this hydrogen comes from fossil fuel. It comes from methane, right? Um, and what we could do is produce that hydrogen from fossil fuel, capturing the CO2 that we actually create when we uh, fabricate that hydrogen. That is the famous blue hydrogen. Um, so refineries are working on to, okay, how do I continue using my processes to continue fabricating hydrogen in the new way? Carbon capture, that's one possibility. Um, you're going to use, if you look into synthetic fuels, you're also using hydrogen when you look about, synth when, you, when you create synthetic fuels. So this is also another area where refineries uh, will be using their know-how. And then again, there is, where is this renewable electricity going to be produced? Where are going to be all those solar panels? Where are going to be all those massive assets where we produce um, renewable electricity? Some will be nearby, but some are going to be far away. One thing refineries are looking into as well is to actually transport that hydrogen. Transport that hydrogen in different forms, right? You, cr you can create ammonia, you use it in, on ships, or we hope we'll be able to use it on ships. But you can also use different aromatics, right, to carry that hydrogen and bring it back to, to um, economies that need them in, in Europe, typically. You get, I don't know, electricity, renewable electricity produced in Saudi Arabia, you actually ship it in the form of toluene to Europe in a refinery. And in that refinery, you change that toluene back <laughs> into hydrogen that can be used locally. So those are things that refineries are looking into. It is very difficult today for the industry to remain relevant, right? Because the assets are huge. It needs a, a very big amount of investment. It needs a very big amount of training. Uh, and it's a huge challenge for the whole industry in Europe, but also elsewhere, to continue being part of the new landscape. Nevertheless, there are some uh, options, there are some technologies coming in, 
And um, yeah, let's let's hope that we will be able to leverage all that know-how, leverage all those assets that uh, have bought values, value before, into the new technologies of the future. Thank you, Elsa. I think that I would like to add one point. Oil majors, they declared that they will transform their companies, like Shell, BP, to renewable energy companies. And somebody will buy these assets. And I think that oil trading companies that are usually light on assets, they might be uh, the buyers. And entire system can shift to trading companies and uh, they will decarbonize these assets as well. But then there is a big issue uh, for traders, uh, how they actually will report, yeah? And there are lots of standards, what we see, uh, the questions from trading companies, which standards we have to use. And I think that we still don't have this harmonization and a lot will come in the nearest future from regulators. And now I would like to uh, give a word to Tagim, who will add a trader's point of view. Uh, good evening again. We met uh, slightly earlier, so I'm still doing the same job. I'm the co-head of uh, Global Physical Trading at SOCAR. Um, obviously, I think one of the things that are important that uh, today SOCAR as a state oil company uh, has sustainability as part of its core values. And we, as the trading arm of SOCAR, are aiming for the same, and we will do a lot of work on that. Um, when talking about the carbon neutral cargos or green cargos, or there are different names for it, and they fall under different criteria and could be evaluated under different criteria, depending on how you count, within the last three years, we've probably seen only 30 cargos which could be labeled in that way pretty much on the LNG and crude and condensate side. Uh, however, this year, uh, we saw the first crude cargo. Uh, that was a project uh, where Macquarie, Oxy, and uh, delivered to Reliance in India. Uh, that was called as carbon neutral oil, first shipment. Um, then there we saw also London, our colleagues from London, which I think are mostly pioneers in that sector. So a lot of things that Zomo said are rather very unique than common in our sector. Uh, doing also a carbon neutral cargo, but it was more, uh, the, the questions of certification and verification were much more um, um, addressed. Just recently, also in September, with first uh, China taking its first carbon neutral crude oil. Uh, it was done by Sinopec, uh, Costco, and the Chinese airlines. And uh, altogether, on the crude side this year, we probably saw five to six cargos from what we can record. And three of them are done by London, and we probably hope to see more by the end of the year. And uh, now the question is, is this a lot? Is it too little? We're back to 99 uh, million barrels a day consumption globally. Um, and three cargos that don't seem to make a big impact given where we stand today in our climate challenge and what we do about it. Um, there are much more done on the LNG side, but if you look into it also, uh, don't, I wouldn't say that this is in any way criticism, but in reality, most of it are done by the same company, which is a good thing for the company and for the business. But on the overall scale of the uh, global physical cargo trading, it seems still very little. So what do I really think, right? I think, I think that's important because otherwise we would not make an input and not make a change. Um, I think it's very important and on the positive side uh, that you are part of that trend. I encourage traders, fellow traders, producers, refiners, shippers, financing entities, whoever are the stakeholders of that process, to be part of that. 
because this is happening, this is unavoidable, how it will happen and how it will develop in future is still unknown. And as mentioned already rightfully by my colleagues, there are so many questions in this because everyone has their own little area in which they're specialized and then there's still very little number of places where all this is built into one chain. But I do encourage you to be part of it because you want to exercise that, you want to be ready for it tomorrow. It is part of our business and it's probably gonna grow much quicker than we expect. Another positive side of it is uh, the public relations, the PR side of it, right? It is good for your companies, it is good for your community, it is good for your environment, it is good for the, to be part of that today. Because if you're not, that means that, I guess, in today's world, if you're not striving to be part of that, we're, we're a little bit behind of, in our thought process. And the third part is actually real, it's the financing part. Uh, today, uh, financial institutions like green transactions. They are encouraging you to do so. You will get some benefit, depending on with whom you're dealing, on doing such transactions. As always, there is a negative side to it as well, and it raises uh, quite a lot of criticism and questions for transparency, or a very popular term as greenwashing. Yeah, if you offset your emissions on the crude, does it really become a green cargo? Your oil becomes greener or not? And I think a big part of it, and my colleagues will talk about it more, about the voluntary and the compliance market and how it works in terms of credit, but what type of credits you're using to offset your emissions? Which credits, how transparent that is? And that is another big question that needs to be addressed. Because the third point on the negative side, there is a general lack of global standards for that today. There are standards, but there is no unification of standards. A lot of people will use this or that, and there are some positive trends in that today, but I hope that after COP26, we see some more unification that we ha than we have today, because the pace, I think we need, we need to catch up on that a bit. Um, So what do I really, really think, right? Um, I think that today, uh, strong push should come not only from the regulators, which are trying to today realize their role and doing already a lot of work on that, but I think it's also fair to say that we see disruptions on the regulation side, right? I think a good example, and it's not about politics, but it's the reality, uh, let's say, presidentship of Donald Trump. Him stepping out of Paris Agreement and Biden coming back to it within hours after he accepted presidency is a big example of a disruption, of a black swan event, if you wish. Or it, it, it happens, right? And it will continue to happen, hopefully less going forward. But this is a very big example as one of the biggest economies, emission producers, oil producers, gas producers, consumers, can have such a big change of heart because there is a change in politics. Um, I think that it is a big responsibility of consumers today, and not only on the corporate level, but also on individual level, to promote the idea of carbon neutrality and being responsible for our emissions. I hope we get to talk about it a bit more in the future, but without accepting that responsibility, the change will lack the personal element that we all carry in our lives every day. And I think that, that together with regulators, that will be a big driver. Um, it is important to say that people and companies care about it, they address it. We as SOCAR talk to our clients a lot about the possibilities of uh, cargo neutral or green cargos. Uh, we discuss how it could be done, how ready they are. Uh, but I somewhat come back to the point raised by Elisa earlier that if you look in the, at the oil sector and the refineries, today, when they have been struggling with margins for the last couple of years, and finally recovering some profits today, it is not one of the biggest priorities on their agenda in terms of their commercial cost allocation. And it is a big question of who is paying that cost today and who will be paying it tomorrow when there are more regulations. I think when I talk to fellow traders, and that's probably one of the useful inputs I can make tonight, is that refiners, traders, no matter which company they represent, they care about the subject, 
They want to be involved. They realize it's important. But most of them, or some of them, at least on the side that we deal with, are not set up to do it. They don't have, let's say, direct instructions to do it, which is also not necessarily, again, a negative thing. Maybe it is done elsewhere in the same company, because it is important, as an example of London, you can reduce your footprint at your production levels, you can reduce your footprint through different optimizations in your company, and that's why maybe offsetting your credits today, which is not an obligation, or offsetting your footprint today, which is not an obligation, is not also on the front line something that we see uh, a lot. But the trend is definitely positive. Um, we witness that. Uh, we are following that closely and we're acting on it. Uh, we have dedicated teams which are growing to do that. And we're not the only one in the sector, obviously, uh, but uh, definitely on uh, the side of SOCAR, uh, it is uh, maybe some criteria that are important on our consideration about the carbon neutral cargos is that a uh, big part of it should be backed by the nature-based projects because that's what we strongly believe in and I guess uh, we'll hear about it a bit f in further but uh, the nature-based based project is something that we're gonna we see big shortage probably coming in the coming years um, and you have to look at it as a way to facilitate cash flow from emitters to the people who actually try to fix this or to try to create some kind of balance. So that, that's one of the angles which we can look at. Um, I think I'll stop here and uh, I want to thank you again for being here because we're all here to care because we care and I really hope we can make a change in the companies we work with communities we live in, and in our everyday life. Thank you very much. It's impressive that we are talking about billions of cars and five, six cargos certified. Yeah. I hope that uh, we will reduce um, at least billions of cars to more electric cars and increased our certified cargos. And I think that actually it's a pity that we don't have anybody today from banking sector, but banking sector will also push trading companies uh, to decarbonize yeah, their supply chain. And I have lots of questions for myself, but I would like to open the floor for you to ask questions. Who wants to be the first one? Yeah, go ahead, please. Please uh, tell Good me evening. your name. Good evening. My name is Felix, mm -hmm. and I have a question to <clears throat> Tagi. From a sustainability point of view, how would you see the transformation mm -hmm. in the physical oil trading, like cargo trading? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I, I try to stress that I think it will take place. It will take place much quicker than we expect. And I think given today's development and hopefully some solid outcomes from COP26, it will be more of a revolutionary event than uh, evolutionary event. Because otherwise I think it will be too slow as well. And it is very important that stakeholders of this process prepare for it. They need to understand what are their footprints today, they need to understand what is their trace they're already leaving, and despite the fact that there are no clear uh, regulations in many of the places where this uh, trading activity takes place, we really have to be ahead of that curve in preparation for it. So the outlook is definitely positive, at least for me. And uh, we try to do the same with SOCAR. At SOCAR, we try to prepare for it, we try to act on it. And uh, I really believe, as I said before, it's becoming one of our core values. I hope I was able to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Tagia. Next one, gentlemen. Thank you, uh, David Kane from Beringa Partners. Uh, thanks, first of all, to the audience for the for the, to the the panel for the fascinating insights. 
Um, Elsa, you brought up the greenhouse gas protocol quite early on in your presentation. Um, and what we're observing a bit in the market is there's a bit of a lack in consistency around how the big players are accounting for their emissions. And Elena, you touched on this as well. Um, that's, I think, going to be a bit of an issue. If, if you're not consistent about how you calculate the emissions, how do you reduce them? I, I think it won't be too long in the distant future before an invoice has not just pricing, volume, etc., but emissions also. How do you see the industry coming together, perhaps forced by a regulator or government legislation, uh, to, to resolve that problem, uh, to bring that consistency to the market? Yes, thank you. That's a very good point. I mean, Intagi was, was touching on it, about standards. Um, I, think, I think that the issue is not really on our scope one emissions and our scope two emissions, right? Those are very easy to calculate. Those are mass balance calculation. It's super easy with, multi with just a multiplication, basically. But when you talk about everything that happens outside of your direct control, then that is becoming very difficult. How does the industry come together? I'm, I'm, I think the only way is transparency, right? I mean, when, when you publish a number, what does this number uh, mean? What are you covering? When you say uh, a carbon neutral cargo, what are you talking about? Are you talking about ex extraction, production, processing, and shipping? Are you talking about more, less? We don't know, and that's a massive issue today. Um, and I'm really hoping that, uh, yes, regulators will have to force um, standards, but then if you talk about international markets, you will need to have a unified definition. Um, and the, the greenhouse gas protocol does an okay job for the moment, but people don't know about it. I mean, it's too technical, it's too difficult, it's, it's, it goes into the nitty gritty things and, and who knows, scope three, chapter 2.61, what does that mean? So there's a lot of work to be done, but for the moment we see uh, initiatives on shipping, for example, we see initiatives on different areas of the, of the chain to, be as, to try to be as transparent as possible. What I see is, let's, let's, I mean, keep ourselves accountable for what it is we, we publish at the moment, because they, there's, no, there's no regulation at the moment, but as Tagi was saying, we need to start quantifying it, and let's, let's keep ourselves as accountable as possible on what is it we're publishing, how we're calculating it, what we're estimating, because don't get me wrong, when I, when I calculate my, my CO2 footprint for my LNG trades, I don't know exactly how much CO2 was emitted when my gas was extracted somewhere. I don't have this information. The only thing I can say is, this is what I estimate because I know it's coming from this. And this is the benchmark. And those benchmarks are going to get more and more specific. Um, and this is my data. This I'm very, very confident. This is my shipping. This is my operations. I know. So I'm able to calculate. It's going to be a journey. I mean, there's going to be a revolution on the market. But in terms of accuracy of the data, this is going to be a very long journey. The only thing we can do at the moment is to try and be as transparent as possible. Thank you, Elsa. Tanya, you want to ask a question? Hi. Yes, thank you already for the nice discussions. My name is Leonie. Um, I have a question related to what Mr. Tagi said before, and actually it's Omo mentioned it already also. Um, it's the point of personal responsibility in here. So I have a question which is not really market related, but more personal curiosity. Everybody who came here today, um, did you come, could you perhaps raise your hand, who came here by car and who didn't come here by car? If I think about personal footprints and... Who, pay, uh, who came yeah. by car? By yeah, car? who came here no. by car, who's in, in the sense that, you know, personal emissions, who came here by bike and who came here I by came car? By perhaps we can raise our hands. By car? No. Who car. came by car now? <laughs> Electric, Electric car, car. Yeah. that's good, that's good, 10 points, 10 points. <laughs> and who came by bike? 
and the rest came by foot, I hope. By a train. Oh, by train, transport. train. Good, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Very true. Thank you so much. <laughs> we had the small research. Thank we still have time for a question. Yes. Um, yeah, there's a gentleman here. Thank you. Um, I was just coming, uh, maybe following on a little bit. My name's James Dunstable. Following on a little bit from the last uh, comments is uh, the f word that hardly comes up is called education. You are doing a fantastic job at company levels. Uh, everybody, governments all love what you're doing. But the person in the street, the guy, the 15-year-old, the 16-year-old, hasn't a clue of what you're talking about. And he can help by reducing his waste, learning how to live a correct life. Can we not have you coming, not talking to us, but maybe talking to the schools and being a little bit more humble on the lower level rather than all this highbrow chit-chat? Sorry to be so blunt. Yeah, but it, it's not only the guy of 50, 60 well, years old, believe me. Yeah. Well, I'm <laughs> 70 and I also need to know too. I think... Um, it's a very, very good point, and thanks for making it. I think there is so much confusion about it all. I think it is a massive problem for companies to just, you know, come up with policies and say, yeah, we're doing a good job without uh, the right level of education. Um, personally, I, I go to schools and universities. I go. I, I, I discuss. I try to... Who aren't intelligent? Okay, um, yeah, I'm going to try. Uh, I'm going to try and find people yeah. who are not intelligent, but I don't know how to identify them. Mm. Okay, um, and I have done sessions in school. Uh, I don't know if this qualifies as not intelligent, um, but it is a massive issue. We 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 do need to do a better job on um, educating uh, everyone, and we do. And, and we need to decarbonize our uh, career and we need to spend more time um, in, the, in the public area. I think everybody has to, to choose where they want to focus as well, right? And this is also a personal choice. And my job is global head of sustainability in a company. I spend my day working on this and I spend my day working professionally on it and then I spend my day talking about it. Every single dinner I go to, people ask me, what is it? What is the energy situation? What intelligent or not intelligent people? And <laughs> I do spend a lot of time talking about it and I could do a better job. I could, definitely. But you could do it as well. You could. Uh, reach out to people, ask questions. You have access to so much information today that you can actually go and read that International Energy uh, Agency report because it's very, very well written. You do have an executive summary um, that is very well written and simple. Doesn't go into the jargon. So, yes, there are a lot of different things we can do at all, at all levels. And... You guys, as much as I, can do something, and companies, through their foundation, whatever, should go to schools and talk to people on this. I agree with you. Thank you, Elsa. I think that all of us can do something, yeah? Uh, we have time for one more question. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fine. So good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I have a practical question to address to you that I got not long, t long time ago myself. So I'm a trader, like the majority of traders here in this uh, uh, studio or whatever hall. So we are all physical oil products traders, and we are just dealing with natural fossils. And this is the reality of this market, and we are not that old, and I think that for some 10, 20, or 30 years onwards, we're going to be in this market. So right now, I am passing through a lot of job interviews, and one of the questions that I have received from the HR of one company which is really caring about the sustainability was that if you are employed, what would you do as a trader, revolutionary ideas on promoting sustainability? We heard a lot about the 
some difficult topics related to the sustainability implementation. So I would like to know your opinion. What current traders that are working in the market might do on their job places now? Thank you. Who wants to take this question? Uh, thank you for the question, and thank you for the previous question. I think Elsa did very well with the answer, but I think we all share the same values when it comes to that. And we do work with youth, and I really want to comment on that because that is also a subject very dear to my heart, that you need to make sure not only people are around you are aware, but all levels of people that are surrounding each other. And you would be surprised how aware are children today whether it's school or high school or mid school, and they have some uh, good samples, be it Greta or be it someone else. I mean, it, it can be contradictory, but people are aware, and I think all of us do that every time, and that's why we're also here today, to share this so that you can carry it home and share it with your family and friends and whoever you deem necessary. But uh, coming back to the trading side, I think that's, that's very correlated. I think that uh, the question that uh, raised before you and uh, with you now, uh, they're completely correlated and they come to the situation with education, in the companies, with your peers. Um, it is important to make sure people are aware why is it important today. Uh, on the trading side, I think one of the challenges, again, is the question of costs, because this is not bringing you, at least as of now, a big advantage on the trading side. And that is something that a lot of trading companies, which are P&L oriented, have a, as a challenge in front of them today. But it is not, it is not um, let's say it is, it is not absolutely um, uh, ridiculous to start actually raising that and saying that your benefit today or your saving today is going to be your cost tomorrow. And the ratio between them could be very different. Maybe one quote on the subject that I like a lot, and I don't know if it really answers your question or not. I think it was an American professor who said, if you choose the importance level between economy and environment, try counting your money while holding your breath. So if we don't care about the environment that surrounds us, whether you're in a trading company, in a bank or a refinery, it's going to affect you financially, eventually, one way or another. So I just wanted to specify, that means that right now, to get to the sustainability issue and basically to start working on that, current traders, they are supposed to get only approval from the management of the company to go in this direction. Because indeed, you're absolutely right, for the moment, economically, it's not going to make any P&L. I think like any other trader, and you, do, you did it in your career, and we do it every day, you have to invest into the future. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a relationship with a counterparty, whether it's a delivery of crude, whether it's a cost for you, and I think, again, London is a good example of that. I think they're, that's why it's important that they are pioneers, and I guess it's also a good uh, uh, exercise, because that makes you prepare, as I said earlier. So definitely worth addressing that. They, mm -hmm. they would appreciate that. I would have. Thank you. And Thank one, you. one thing I would add as well is, is, as a trader, ask what is the carbon footprint of your trades, basically. Do you know that? Do you know how much it is? is what are the options? There are things that you could do that are very small ones, but there are. And even knowing how much CO2 your trade you know, has generated is an information you will be needing at some point when it will have an impact on your PL. Be ready for this. And obviously, you're already doing something. I, I wish every day a trader would come to me and ask me, Elsa, how much tons of CO2 does this <laughs> trade actually generate? This is my dream. It doesn't happen yet. But do, do it, because then people know about it. Then you know what good looks like. You know what your benchmark is. You, need, you generate four tons of CO2 per ton of LNG. That's a lot. Nobody knows or nobody cares or as a trader, you should. You have uh, now, you can find the price of CO2 on the internet. How much the price of CO2 will be in the very near future. Take a 30, 30 euro, 100 euro. A lot of people are using 100 euro. Ha be ready for when it comes. Know what, what good looks like, what your trade looks like. That, that would be the day-to-day -day action that I would actually 
Uh, doesn't it sound for you like a double standard that we, for example, see now on the COP conference when people come uh, to the conference, for example, and then talk about the CO2 emissions and then afterwards leave on the private jets? So, yeah, uh, Tanya, it's, an, it's another topic <laughs> you can is, ask Elisa yeah. during, during the cocktail. But I think that <laughs> it's a good point, actually, Elsa. I wish that you have a system when traders can see what is the carbon footprint of their cargoes, and maybe they have KPI in their p &L also about carbon intensity of their cargoes. So it's another topic yet, how traders can make an impact. Uh, but I think that it's time to open second uh, part of our conference. And while, while you're still thinking, like, what's um, your next job after trading diesel and oil, I think that you can consider carbon trading. And um, I'm moving to uh, carbon trading markets and uh, want to give a word to Alexis Kazan, who is uh, Managing Director of uh, Biofuels and Carbon Markets in Cargill. Alexis. Thank you, Elena. I, allow me to stand up because Sorry. I don't find the, sit the sitting position sustainable for two hours. <laughs> um, so uh, just one uh, answer also to your question when you say that uh, we should tell the youngsters that uh, they need to be aware. I, I think they are very aware, more than we are. One of my daughters is, uh, is uh, with Extinction Rebellion, so I can tell you that the pressure is on. <laughs> and I, I think that a lot of people, uh, uh, the younger they are, the more aware they are about global warming. So I'm not going to um, tell you about what uh, my company Cargill does on decarbonization. It does quite a lot, but if there are questions, I can answer them later. I'm going to talk about um, carbon markets. Um, 10 minutes is a little bit uh, short for that. I will do my best and I will mostly uh, speak about the compliance markets and the voluntary markets. So, um, first question, can carbon markets contribute to the decarbonization of our economies? Yes, the answer is yes, but now let's, let's go and see how. Um, first popular uh, way to decarbonize the economy is the carbon tax. We have seen that since uh, many years. This is probably the most brutal way of doing it because it's a flat tax, it, it has no granularity, it doesn't really differentiate between the carbon footprints of different products. And at the end of the day, it's also a tax on the consumer if the product is in short supply or if uh, the product is in an oligopole or in a monopole. So an example is um, what happened to uh, Mr. Macron the three years ago with the Gilets jaunes uh, story when he tried to increase the carbon tax on diesel. Um, if you want uh, the consumer to bear the brunt, the, 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 uh, the cost of the, of the decarbonization, it's difficult to do. Now, the, there are industry-specific compliance programs. This is what I know best because I'm, my uh, background is biofuels. You have a lot of these different programs in the EU. One of them is so the one on, on, on uh, low carbon fuels called the Renewable Energy Directive in the EU. It calls the fuel distributors like Shell, BP, uh, Total and others to incorporate low carbon fuels at the pump. Another example is uh, the EU policy that calls the car manufacturers to end any sale of a, a car uh, that um, uh, emits greenhouse gases by 2035, which basically means there will be no more gasoline and diesel cars sold by 2035 in the EU. Two, two examples of powerful um, policies towards decarbonization. Then, the compliance market, I'm going to talk about it now with the example of the EU, and the voluntary markets for those companies, multinational companies, who want to do more, who are outside of uh, countries um, where there is a compliance market, who are under the pressure um, from NGOs, shareholders, uh, employees, customers. So let's start with the, um, uh, this statement. The share of carbon emissions covered by decarbonization scheme is today very modest. As you can see here, 
the, the gray is overall CO2 emissions. The red is the emissions not covered. It's glo global. So only 16% of the emissions globally of CO2 are covered by any uh, of these uh, decarbonization schemes. Carbon taxes, compliance markets, voluntary markets. So you see that the compliance markets have the biggest share, but it's still 11% only. And it doesn't mean that these um, decarbonization schemes do a great job to decarbonize uh, the obligated parties, but at least they are there to, to try to drive behaviors. So very modest coverage of decarbonization schemes at global level. Now, a compliance, the best example of a compliance market, a generic compliance market, is the EU ETS. It's the, the eldest one. You have more than uh, the EU ETS. You have one in California. You have now one in China, which just started. But the EU ETS is the most, I would say, uh, efficient that has really driven behaviors. You see on the, on, on the right-hand side, um, the ref verified emissions going down since 2006, for sure, not only thanks to ETS. There was the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, 2020, obviously, COVID crisis, but it has played a role because the, the trend is really strong. In blue, these are the utilities. The uh, free allocations, or if you want, the polluting rights given by the EU to the utilities. This um, ETS system is a cap and trade system, meaning that the supply is generated by the EU. It's an it's a administered market, a market with a purpose. So the EU uh, gives for free polluting rights, if you want, or, or permits, but less and less every year. It creates scarcity. And therefore, uh, the obligated party has no choice but to decarbonize its value chain, its core business, or pay the price for not doing it. And you see that the EU has decreased significantly the uh, free allocation in 2014 for the utilities. And this has really uh, um, um, had as a consequence that most of the um, uh, coal uh, uh, utilities are closing their doors slowly but surely in the EU. Um, now, it's, it's true to say that the low-hanging hanging fruits have been taken in the EU because it's easier to decarbonize the, the utilities than the rest of the industry. This is what we see in red, the heavy industry, cement, steel, uh, aluminum, um, fertilizers, uh, etc. Much more difficult to decarbonize because we don't have any easy solution. For a utility, in a way, it's easy. You move from coal to wind, coal to sun, or even coal to nuclear, or coal to gas. Uh, for uh, others, that's uh, 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 industries, that's more difficult. Second, very powerful incentive to decarbonize, apart from the scarcity on the allocations, is obviously the price, just behind me. 60 euros per ton the last days. Uh, this is very, very uh, uh, powerful. You, well, Cargill is an obligated party on ETS, and believe me, we do everything to decarbonize because we see the price of not doing it. So this system works. It's being now copied by others. I hope it will be copied by the, uh, all over the world uh, to make sure that at the end of the day, we have one carbon price um, globally. Now, the compliance market are not the only markets. There are many, many continents, countries, where you don't have any compliance market. And for those responsible companies who want to do more and who want um, uh, to be seen by you know, their employees, their shareholders, their customers, their NGOs, uh, as, as taking care of the climate, there is a voluntary market. Let's take the example of BP. Uh, uh, in this chart. Why BP? Because they were the first uh, petroleum company, uh, maybe I'm wrong, uh, uh, Zomo, but to declare net zero uh, last year. Maybe you did first, I don't know. Okay, yeah, all right. Let's, so let's say it's Lundin then. 
So in a business as usual scenario, you are in the yellow block, meaning the emissions continue to increase until around 2040. In a, um, in a scenario where the petroleum company says, I'm going to decarbonize my supply chain, my core business, we are in the blue block. But you see that you never reach zero if you are a petroleum company, if you are uh, an airline, if you are a shipping company, if you, if you are a fertilizer company, a cement company, you are never going to be at zero. It's impossible. You still are going to use some hydrocarbons, some metals, etc. So the only way to reach net zero is to do, compensa uh, to do offsets. So this is what we see in green below. This is the negative value. Why negative? Because it's sequestration of CO2 into the soil through different ways, through reforestation, through uh, preservation of forests, through restoration of mangroves, uh, uh, etc., etc. So the only way for a petroleum company or another big industry to reach net zero is to buy negative values, to delegate the effort to others. Of course, then you need to, to do it well. This is the next question. You need reliable offsets, you need audits, you need verification. Uh, and that's a hot topic in Glasgow these days. Um, what we see now, more and more companies are declaring net zero. It's becoming fashionable. Everybody wants to be net zero uh, uh, soon. Um, what we see on this chart is that there will be a problem on the supply side. The supply on the voluntary market is not coming from an institution, like in the compliance market. It's coming from project developers, from persons and, and, and companies who have developed real projects on the ground, like, for example, a reforestation. Well, what we see is that, uh, this is, by the way, a, gra a chart coming from Shell. Um, so what we see is by 2024, the, um, uh, the demand in gray is going to be higher than the supply in yellow. And therefore, the purple line is becoming negative, which means that the stocks of available offsets are going down. The stocks are decreasing. So we are soon going to have a problem on the supply of offsets. And uh, as I told you before, that uh, there is no way uh, most of the big corporations can reach net zero without offsets. We will have an issue. Last slide is offsets. What kind of offsets do we need? Today, and over the last two years, the biggest part of the, or the biggest volume of offsets was around renewable energy, energy efficiency. But more and more, um, the compliance markets are covering the need to move from uh, um, a hydrocarbon-based uh, energy into uh, a renewable uh, energy. Therefore, um, this is already covered by the law, in a way, by the compliance market. So the voluntary markets don't bring any additionality. So less and less is going to come from um, uh, renewable energy. One, because they are the compliance market. Two, because simply it's more economical in many, many countries to do from zero um, wind electricity than, than a coal plant. Um, so this is... Um, we are not going to see a lot of offsets coming from renewable energy. What we, we need, this is what oh, this uh, chart that is also coming from Shell shows, that we are going to, to need more and more nature-based removals. So, and what, what does it mean? It means uh, a big effort around preservation of forests, around reforestation, um, um, uh, restoration of mangroves, uh, works uh, around the, the ocean, blue carbon, etc. Uh, more and more needs to be done there. In Glasgow, we had good news around the um, uh, deforestation, or at least announcements. Uh, let's see if it's, um, it's going to be followed by acts. But you can see the light gray and the, and the yellow together is moving from around um, 40... Um, 43% to 75% uh, of the offset that we will need in the future. The, the bad news is this takes time. 
to develop a project that is going to be registered by one of the registries with a, an acceptable protocol takes between 12 and 24 months. This is why we need more and more people to launch these kinds of uh, removal projects. Stay tuned, the Glasgow conference is going to announce something on the Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which is precisely about the offsets. Greta uh, Thunberg told us yesterday that that was all greenwashing. I, I, I think we need radical persons like her, and I, I think it's great to have her announce, uh, you know, pushing hard. But on this precise question, I disagree, provided this is well done, and offset is part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. Yeah. Eighty-four percent of emissions are not covered, and uh, we don't have enough uh, projects to offset right now. It's uh, impressive numbers, and I think that uh, we're coming back again to the same question of education and making an effort. And finally, I would like to introduce our last speaker, Mattia Ferracchiato, who will talk about shipping and decarbonization of shipping. Good evening again. Um, so sorry first, I've been uh, sick for over the last two weeks, so I'm slowly recovering. Thanks God was not COVID. So if you see me like kind of like a pale or sweaty, it's not because I'm gonna die here. <laughs> I had a very bad infection. Um, so thank you everybody, thank you Elena. Um, as you all know now, uh, today almost 80% of the goods are shipped, are carried by vessels. And the uh, shipping is responsible of 3% uh, of the global greenhouse gases. Uh, even though it's the best, uh, it's the most efficient way of transport, is facing a big pressure to reduce its emission to zero. In, uh, at BRS Brokers, we have, I personally also seen, I've seen that this pressure is mainly coming from regulators, uh, clients, and, uh, and also banks. We, um, we have seen uh, recently uh, how, how all these tax company, food companies, um, multinationals um, like Amazon, Zara, all of them are trying to decarbonize their business. And, the, and the, what, they, what, they, what they are doing, as also Elsa said, is they are trying to reduce the emission inside their operations, scope one and two. But for them, uh, scope three emission related to shipping has become a big issue. A few days ago, we had this big announcement on the New York Times. That's the perfect example of how clients can pressure, can put some pressure on, on, uh, on, shipping, on ship owners and operators. Because we had Amazon and uh, Thara and other seven big companies saying that by 2040 they will only uh, run uh, ships uh, that are using carbon zero, uh, net zero uh, fuels. And, um, and of course for them, again as also Elsa said, it's quite easy. It's, it's an easy challenge decarbonizing their, their, their scope one and two, especially when we are talking about Amazon. You know, Amazon is uh, mainly, uh, they, are, they have a small fleet of, uh, of, uh, of cars, trucks, but their big carbon footprint is related to the, to the data center that are more or less spread everywhere. And, uh, and if they want to make their carbon neutral, they switch, they switch to green energy. Today, certifying, certifying green energy is quite easy because we have uh, GEO, Guarantee of Origins, that you can buy, you can purchase. You have IREX, International Renewable Energy Certificates, that you can use when uh, GEO is mainly for Europe and uh, IREX are for renewable energy produced out of Europe. And, uh, and that's pretty much easy you know, for them. So now their focus is on shipping and, uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, as also we have said before, the, there's a huge lack of technologies and fuels available because we don't have green ammonia, we don't have green hydrogen, 
we don't have enough biofuels to supply all these sectors because we are not talking about you know shipping we're talking about uh, steel cement companies all of them are testing these fuels so we see the chart before uh, there's going to be also a competition they're going to fight for for these fuels and the, um, and the for 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 the ship owners not only have this pressure now because because they they say okay so what we can do they 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 used to rely on IMO but now IMO, IMO has become now is seen as like uh, like uh, quite weak uh, as this IMO strategy is seen as a weak strategy because to to give you an idea we when Europe is setting a carbon neutral strategy, a carbon neutral goal by 2050. And Maersk, which is one of the biggest ship owners, is setting a carbon neutral goal by 2040. And you, IMO, set a carbon neutral goal, which is, uh, we don't have it. And the only goal we have is, we have is uh, like, uh, we want to reduce uh, by 50% the emission of the sector by 2050. That is kind of, you know, we are not, you know, we are not sailing at the same speed, right? <laughs> to say a, met a shipping metaphor. So, so, so the shipping sector is okay. Uh, we don't know what to do. We have pressure from clients, pressure from regulators, EUTS, uh, maybe a global carbon tax from IMO, we don't know when, and, uh, and we, don't, we don't know what to do. So the only solution for them at the moment, unfortunately, is uh, improving the energy efficiency of the fleet, um, by um, investing in new, more efficient eco-vessels, or um, reduce the speed, which is also another problem, that, which is a solution, but also a problem, especially because we want to, we, you know, we are, we are a civilization now that we are buying us crazy, right? Uh, we see that uh, during last year in COVID, when we were buying all our, our like gym things at home, and then and you were seeing on Amazon, uh, you will receive that in June, and you were like, okay, but by June I'm gonna be out of the lockdown, right? So we want everything fast, right? And um, and so basically, uh, what is interesting is that um, some in some countries, you have incentive schemes. Uh, uh, for those companies that are improving the energy efficiency, which for them, for my, for me, in my opinion, is the best solution now, because we all say measure, reduce, and then offset. So when you try to reduce, you are improving the energy efficiency of your company or of, of the fleet. And uh, and uh, I believe, I strongly believe that these companies, also the shipping sector, need support from incentives from some from or national or international. Uh, scheme. In Italy and France, for example, we have uh, the white certificate schemes. Uh, those, uh, those certificates are tradable certificates, similar to the carbon offsets, but very expensive. So the company actually are really motivated to invest that because one white certificate is almost 260 euros. So you, you invest a lot in efficiency. And, um, and, um, and it, this includes also shipping. We have seen Grimaldi and uh, Grandi Navi Veloce uh, investing in uh, energy efficiency in order to get these white certificates. But in order to get these white certificates, you have to be Italian or French. <laughs> and unfortunately, those two countries are, um, are not you know, big players in the climate change. So we have found a solution in BRS uh, we haven't created this solution. We were investigating um, on this uh, how to incentivize ship owners to decarbonize their their business. And uh, international, we have found uh, um, that gold standard, which set the rules to develop carbon projects, has approved over the last few years uh, two shipping methodologies. So basically, you can see that from the chart. If a vessel owner, a ship owner, is improving the energy directly to the ship owner, so there are this kind of discussion right now, so whether, who is gonna pay for it, basically. But what, what surprised me is that, despite this sector is considered a very traditional sector, nobody is complaining about the, the implementation of the carbon tax of the ETS. So which gives me you know, a little bit of hope, because uh, finally also the sector is quite mature to accept that is the only one uh, not covered, on the only not uh, energy-intensive sector not covered by the by a carbon tax, a carbon scheme in Europe. 
they were able to evade that over 10 years, but now it's their turn. And also because, uh, you know, it uh, depends also, they are in, at the same time, they are investing uh, several hundreds of millions on uh, alternative fuels. And so they have now all the interest to make this investment, you know, uh, profitable. And it, these investments are not going to be profitable if there is no car uh, carbon tax. Like, uh, like we have seen uh, Marsk investing in uh, green ammonia, uh, MOL, uh, HAPAG, uh, MSC, all these companies are investing now in alternative fuels. But they, and at, at the same time now they are pushing for a carbon tax because they are scared. They are scared of losing money. And, the, um, and, the, um, and also um, what, what I personally believe is that uh, it doesn't matter who is gonna pay for the emissions, whether the ship owner or the operator. Um, what is important is, is uh, who is going to hedge properly, and also um, are we going to pass at the end this cost uh, as usual to the end user? So are we going to pay a lot? Uh, is uh, our goods, is the shipping sector finally maybe, uh, because when we talk about sustainability, you know, you know sustainability usually is not only climate, it's not only environment, but it's also like in gender equality, social aspects, so maybe, maybe it's time to also, you know, less be less greedy and accept that if we are responsible for the emission, maybe uh, it's not fair that you guys you have to pay for this cost, right? And uh, and uh, and then um, and then also Mattia, we have. Sorry, we're just running out of time. Ah, sorry, 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 <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. So yeah, well. Yeah. Ask me. I, ask I me understood later. that uh, <laughs> in the shipping there are lots of issues. Actually, yeah, Greece will pay, but Italians and French they will get the white certificates. So. Yeah, exactly. um, and uh, thank you for your presentation. Really, <laughs> thank you. We have five minutes for questions. Who wants to go first? Yeah, Paul. Uh, hi, good evening. It's uh, Annelise from Agflow. I have a question for Alexi. Um, I wonder if you could if you could share uh, to what extent does farming help to offset carbon? Farming. Yeah. Yes. Do you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. Now. Well. Um, farming is probably um, the biggest, the, the, the toughest nut to crack, I would say. Um, to be able to say that regenerative agriculture, because this is it at the end of the day, uh, conservation agriculture, agriculture really sequestrates carbon, is difficult. It, it, it does the job for sure, but it's difficult to measure. And a lot of companies, including Cargill, are trying to uh, invest into that, uh, into regenerative agriculture. It doesn't work, right? Um, because, um, w well, we are coming from a, a period after the war where we have increased the productivity a lot, used more and more uh, chemical fertilizers, and we are now in a period where we try to use both science, agronomy, and at the same time rediscover uh, farming practices that were known a long time ago, um, and to blend that together to, to create what we call regenerative agriculture. It's about leaving the soil in peace to make sure that it can build biodiversity, sequ sequestrate carbon, and this is about uh, no tilling, stop tilling the soil, so stop ploughing uh, the, the soil. It's about cover crops, never leave the soil nude. It's about, about stop uh, uh, reducing the use of chemical um, uh, fertilizers. All these practices together improve the sequestration of carbon into the soil. And also, by stopping to use a lot of chemical fertilizers, you avoid emitting um, a nitrogen oxides. So there is a lot of merit in doing that, not only for the carbon's sake, but also for the biodiversity and the, the soil health. And at the end of the day, in 50 years from now, it's about uh, feeding the world. Um, 
So there, there is a lot of merit in doing that. The problem is, how do we measure that? And everybody is trying to crack this nut. It's going to come, we are going to make it, uh, but it's difficult to measure. Are we going to use um, uh, physical tests, uh, drones, satellites? We know that it's working, but we need to measure it to be able to then make it profitable for the farmer to change his or her farming practices from monoculture to regenerative agriculture. Thank you. Dmitry Kalinin, one more question for Mr. Kazin uh, regarding uh, potential evolution of carbon pricing mechanisms. Uh, we all want carbon to be kept in soil or under or in the trees. And we don't want uh, carbon to be in the air or in the ocean. But c current carbon pricing mechanisms, we are focusing on emission. What do you think? Should it be supplemented with some carbon taxes uh, linked with extraction of carbon from the earth, kind of mining taxes. So if I understand well your question, you mean that uh, the priority should be to focus on emissions reductions, abatements? No, no, C currently uh, we are taxing emissions. Yes. But actually, as soon as you extract carbon or carbon containing substance from the earth, this carbon will find its way to atmosphere anyway, like sooner or later. But at now, uh, with uh, ENP companies, mining companies, we are not taxed for extracting carbon from the earth. So should we add this, this mechanism to to existing one, or even replace? Yeah. Well, the, basically, what you you mean is a carbon tax on mining companies. I think, you know, this is coming everywhere. The carbon tax. Uh, um, in, in Glasgow, we had uh, interesting announcements. Uh, a lot of a coalition of country is going to stop financing new coal plants uh, outside of the, their borders. Um, um, but, um, the ca the, yeah, the carbon tax is a good mechanism. And um, a big um, story is going to happen in 2023 or four around the so-called CBAM, so the European Carbon Tax, Carbon bo Border Adjustment Mechanism. This is... Uh, a, a, a tax that the EU wants to put at the EU borders in order to protect its own industry against um, competition from, I don't know, a, a steel company, cement company, fertilizers company who, who, who don't care about uh, their carbon emissions. So the, the EU, uh, most probably soon together with the US, is trying to drive behaviors by threatening to put this tax. This tax will arrive, it will be difficult to implement, because it's easy to, to, to tax the carbon content of uh, steel bars. It's much more difficult to uh, test the carbon, to tax the carbon content of, uh, I don't know, uh, a mobile phone or uh, a computer, uh, where the pieces are coming from everywhere. But taxation is for sure needed, yes. Uh, thank you, yeah, Paul. Uh, the last question, I see that Maxwell and Natalia with hand, but yeah, let's take the last question and you can ask afterwards. Yeah. Yes, um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, good evening. Uh, thank you for the five of you because you well explain how complex is, um, how complex are all the underlying notions uh, and uh, the processes to measure, mitigate and uh, offset the carbon footprint for, uh, for um, in the industry and to claim for carbon neutrality. And that uh, there, is a, there is a strong need for, uh, for standardization, verification, transparency, and even the credibility in the, uh, in the claim for carbon neutrality. And I would like to highlight to, uh, to those in the room that, uh, that still do not know that, that there is a, a new standard based in Geneva, created in Geneva, so that's a Swiss-based standard, uh, a certification standard for uh, carbon neutrality, uh, for carbon neutral commodity transactions based on the best standards uh, for uh, carbon footprint calculation, for uh, high quality uh, offset uh, credits and uh, third party verification that is uh, answering these needs for uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, those demands for standardization, verification, and transparency. And this standard is climate neutral commodity that I'm uh, glad to, uh, to, uh, to be part of. Paul, you decided to make a small advertising, yeah? <laughs> exactly. <Thank laughs> I you. got you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's another uh, CTA project, actually. 
I think that um, it was the last uh, question or advertising that we take. And I found that uh, we, we had a great discussion and uh, a bit of fun as well, laughing. And I want to thank to our speakers today and our experts. Um, you still have chance to ask them all your questions during the opera. And uh, uh, to wrap up, I think that uh, I want all of you to have only one takeaway. That uh, we know what we can do. And now we have to do what we can. And um, maybe the most caring part for me is that even if we do something, Still, we have to adapt. And right now, we can shorten this adaptation gap, and our actions will be uh, enjoyed by our children. And I would like to do just one small experiment with all of you. I know that all of you want to have a glass of wine. It's hot. <laughs> just listen carefully. Look around, just look around what's around. I, I put all the steps for you. <laughs> Capture the picture. <laughs> yeah, everybody is a bit tired already, I guess. And now you can stand up only if somebody in front of you, behind or by side is standing up already. Begin. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. I think that you can see that one small action together and we can have a huge impact. That's why I'm releasing you to have your glass of wine and discuss your one small action.